Welcome to our weekly Church on the Rock podcast. For more information, visit us at churchak.org, download our Church on the Rock AK app, or like us on our Facebook page. Thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoy our weekly podcast. What's up, church? How is it going? 10 a.m.? Good to see you guys. Hello, onlineers as well. Glad you are here with us too. Well, we made it. It's May 1st. Yes! I feel like May 1st is a special day for Alaska. We should have an Alaskan holiday in May 1st because May 1st just marks a great time to be in Alaska. We're in the good months, May, June, July. Flowers are blooming. The trees are blossoming. It is a good time to be alive in Alaska. So also, uh, this weekend, of course, we, uh, it's the, the women's retreat weekend, so a lot of the ladies are at retreat, including my wife. Uh, they are worshiping God and fellowshipping together, and my wife said she did a facial, and they're lighting candles and potpourri, all that stuff. Um, so here is what me and my boys have been up to. Um, check it out. We've been eating ice cream sandwiches all weekend. We have just been loving life, man. Um, making some good memories together. That's my sippy cup. Don't judge. It doesn't spill. It's very efficient. Man, so, so today we are going to be talking about a, a big topic, a vast topic, uh, the topic of worship. Uh, and as worshipers, um, we're going to talk about uh, this kind of threefold thing that we should be doing as worshipers. Uh, remember respond and reflect. And so I'm just going to be getting into um, why we worship and uh, defining worship itself, the why, what of worship. So speaking of ice cream sandwiches, ice cream sandwiches have no nutritional value whatsoever in them. Um, But food is not just fuel. Uh, And it can be just fuel. Sure, we can make some sci-fi protein drink, pack it full of vitamins and proteins, drink that in the morning and be good. But uh, there's something in us, something how God created us that we want a little more from that. We we want maybe just the memory of food as well. Like, hey, remember that bacon burger we had um, at that place? Let's go back and get that. Uh, ice cream sandwiches, for instance, that, that's, that's a very fond memory of me and my dad. We used to sit around eating ice cream sandwiches. And so there's something with that uh, comfort and uh, uh, marking a, a certain time or memory in a child's life that we want to uh, uh, remember as a, a small little bit of legacy there. Uh, music is the same way. Music can just be background noise, but I don't know if you've ever... You know, you've got thousands of songs on your phone and it's on shuffle and you just keep hitting skip on the next song and you want to find that song that just strikes a chord. We're created that way. We're created that way. Or maybe that ultimate fishing spot, right, that's going to be a legacy for your family and an awesome memory for your family or friends. Life is the same way. Life is not uh, just a life cycle. It's not just being born and you get educated and then uh, you go to work and work stinks and then you die kind of thing. It's pretty drab. No, life is meant for so much more for that. It is meant to be a legacy of worship that we can pass that on from uh, generation to generation. There's something in us that yearns for more, something that we want to fill our hearts and our souls with. And worship is that thing. We were created to worship like a lion and on the savanna that was created to hunt, we were created to worship. So we will worship someone or something. It is inevitable. Harold Best defines worship as acknowledging that someone or something else is greater, worth more, and by consequence to be obeyed, feared, and adored. Worship is the sign that in giving myself completely to someone or something, I want to be ruled by it. Harold is talking about YouTube, of course. But we will worship something. 
And that thing could even be ourselves. Uh, in the Old Testament, um, I guess if the Old Testament was a, a comic book, I feel like the antithesis and bad guy to worship, if worship was named Captain Worship, there would be the evil doctor idol. And uh, idol and worship are always at odds at each other, at war. The worshipers are being distracted by this shiny thing, this idol. Uh, Tim Keller in his book, Counterfeit God, says, an idol is anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God and anything that you seek to give you what only God can give you. When we seek for that thing to give us what only God can give gives us, it becomes an idol. And those things can be good things that can be used for good, but when we put them over God, they become idols, like materialism. It could be your job, entertainment, sex, comfort, the illusion of financial security, or safety, or just the pursuit of being happy. I just want to be happy. I just want to be happy all the time. Uh, in Psalm 115, this is a psalm that uh, talks about uh, idols. Um, but their idols are silver and gold, are made by human hands. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. The psalm is saying that that. What we worship is what we're going to be like. What we worship is what we're going to be like. And we're called to be like Jesus. So when we worship Jesus, we become like Jesus. Now, when these psalms are written, uh, these people were worshiping idols are made of wood and metal and stone. And, and, and see, they, they took pride in what they could see with their eyes. And they had disdain and, and, and hatred for the things that they could not see. We often put too much value in these tangible man-made objects or achievements rather than putting the value in the intangible realities of life such as salvation, spiritual growth, spending time with loved ones or, or being generous to those in need. We can worship our own happiness, our own satisfaction. We have the privilege here in this country that we can try to do that at any given moment. And when we worship self, it leads to sin and can lead to dark roads. And so, church, I just want to propose to you that a worshipful life is the cure for a self-centered life. The number one pound-for-pound pound best fighter in the world in the mixed martial artist world is a man by the name of Kamaro Usman. He hails from Nigeria. His nickname is the Nigerian Nightmare. He's the welterweight champion of the world. He's on a 19-fight win streak. Um, in between his fights, though, he can be kind of quiet and he kind of goes off the map and he's not in the media so much. So he was scheduled to fight this... Uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu specialist by the name of Gilbert Burns, and it was a highly anticipated matchup. And the media was starting to have conversations of who actually is the pound-for-pound pound best fighter in the world, and his name was being left out of the conversation as they were uh, talking about uh, uh, more flamboyant fighters, fighters that were uh, uh, talking a lot in the media and were in social media a lot, and they had forgotten all about Kamaru Usman. So when the bout would take place, Kamaro would dominate and knock out Gilbert Burns in the second round. And after the fight, he approached one of the cameras in the ring and he, he stuck his face in the camera. And he said in his African accent, put some respect on my name. And everyone was like, ooh, in the fighter world and the fans and the, and the media were like, oh, man, we're sorry, Kamaru. You are the pound for pound best. We are sorry. We forgot. We got a little distracted. And we can be a lot like uh, the media. We are humans. We, we, we get distracted. We forget. We forget and get distracted by the shinier or louder things at the time. Uh, and the Bible says the word remember is stated in the Bible 158 times. It says remember, 
remember, remember. Um, when Moses was face to face with the burning bush, um, he had his shoes off and he's in the presence of God. And God says, I know that your people are uh, in captivity in Egypt and you tell them that I'm going to bail them out. I'm going to get them out of Egypt, Moses. And Moses says, that's great. What do I tell them who sent me? Which, you know, who do I tell them sent me? What is your name? You know, how do I explain this to the people? And so uh, Exodus uh, 3.14 God said to Moses, Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. You tell them, I am sent you. I am a God of the past. I am a God of the present. I am a God of the future. I have no tense to my name. My nature cannot be declared in words. I cannot be conceived by human thought. I exist as nothing else does eternally. If I am to give myself a name expressive of my nature, Moses' language doesn't cut it. But if I have to be called something, call me I am. So church, as we enter into worship as a kind of first phase, we are to put some respect on his name. We are to remember who this God is that we worship and have this reverence. Churches all across the nation have become you know, super casual, which is, which is good, but we're also to have this, this, this reverence to who this God is we worship. We need to make sure that we remember who he is Worship of the true living, excuse me, worship of the living and true God is essentially an engagement with him alone on the terms that he proposes and in the way that he alone makes possible. He makes worship possible first and foremost. We need to remember that. It's God's initiative, his authority, his enabling power and the Holy Spirit makes worship even possible for us. We don't bring this to the table first, right? He does. We are to have this submission to him and we are to have this homage to him. And I love this word homage. It means special honor and respect shown publicly. It's like if the high king was on his throne and we're to walk uh, in this huge throne room with all these people around us and we would bow down to the king and everyone would see that we were bowing down. There's a certain power and, and reason for that homage. This is why we gather. Worship is a lifestyle, absolutely, but there is an evangelistic power in public worship. When we get in our cars, when we uh, drive to church, there is a certain thing to this homage and this public declaration when we're worshiping God Together, I, I love this layout, this circular layout that we can see each other worship. There's an encouragement and an edifying spirit that comes with that. Hebrews 10, 24 um, through 25. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the, the more as you see the day approaching, as we see Jesus approaching. We are to remember who God is and celebrate what Jesus has accomplished for us through his righteous life, his atoning death. And we will most likely experience this fresh awareness of God's nearness. Our position in Jesus hasn't changed by just coming to church but after worshiping together, our appreciation of him has. And guess what happens? The church is built up and God is glorified. Sometimes you might hear um, 
someone say, you know, worship gets me in a place where I don't have to think about anything. And we ought to engage our minds. We ought to worship God with our minds as well. Worship is to think of his holiness. It's the feeding of the mind with his truth. And to imagine with our mind his beauty, his vastness, his, his, his eternal power. And then we open our heart to his love. And we surrender to his purpose. We gather all of this up in worship. There's a definition from 1930 that I'll give you from William Temple. Worship is the most selfless emotion of which our nature is capable of and therefore the chief remedy for that self-centeredness which is our original sin and the source of actual sin. When we are completely involved in self-centeredness, it will lead to sin. A worshipful life is a cure for a self-centered life. When I was in ninth grade, um, PE class decided that we were going to do dance classes, like formal dance classes like the Jitterbug, the Waltz, and the Foxtrot. Um, and that was quite the sight. Uh, I was in this big gymnasium, and all the boys would uh, line up against the wall with their backs against the wall, and all the ladies would do the same, um, and they would just kind of stare at each other, it was super awkward, the wall felt so good on your shoulder, it was just like, this is my only support system I have right now, back against the wall, and then the music would start, we're supposed to respond to that, you know, nobody did, we just stayed up, <laughs> stayed up against the wall, man, um, as worshipers, after remembering who God is, I'll quote a 1970s disco song, get your back up off the wall. We, we have to respond in worship. We respond here, uh, but we also respond in life. We are free to move in life after remembering what God has done for us. See, worship is the human response to the self-revelation of the, tr of the triune God, which involves a divine invitation, an initiation in which the Father graciously reveals himself, his purpose, and his will through Jesus. A spiritual and personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ, enabled by the Holy Spirit. And then here it is, church, a response by the worshiper of joyful adoration, reverence, humility, submission, and obedience. We sometimes um, have different nuances of saying what we want to respond to, and like you might hear in worship. And I uh, spent over a decade uh, in worship ministry as a worship pastor, and you, you would hear all kinds of different things from people, different comments, different suggestions of what you should do. And you know, some of them were like, you know, um, with twenty minutes. I don't really have time to worship. I need like a certain time, like, like there's a certain timer to worship, right? Or by the third song, I was really worshiping then. It's though we warm the Holy Spirit up in worship. We are to seek to honor him with our every thought and every action all of the time. Uh, I'd often feel a lot of pressure as a worship pastor too, like, well, Pastor, ready to lead us into the throne room? Let's enter in with you. And you're just like, man, I mean, what have I messed this up? But Jesus is the true mediator between us and the Father. And the worship pastor's job is very, very important to set an atmosphere and, and, and have everyone singing as one voice to the Lord. Very powerful and very important job for sure. But Jesus has entered into the throne room uh, for us, and it is a one and done deal, church. I'll, I'll, I'll read you from Hebrews 10, 12, uh, 25. But when the priest, uh, but, excuse me, but when this priest Jesus had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And it's since that time he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. 
For by one sacrifice, he made perfect forever those who are being made holy. We are being made holy because of what Jesus has done. Jesus has done it for us. Through faith in his finished work, we now have the privilege of confidently and boldly drawing near to God. What brings us into the presence of God is the death and resurrection of Jesus. So we respond, guys. We, we, we respond by encouraging one another. We edify one another in song, spiritual songs and hymns together. And as a result, we're renewed. We're renewed in our awareness of God. We're renewed in our awareness of God's love, of God's truth. And we're encouraged to respond in adoration, and in action. I'll give you a quick little action step we can do. It's coming up really soon. May 22nd is Impact Alaska. We're going to leave these church walls, and we're going to go worship outside of the church building. We're going to be cleaning up lawns and parks and just loving the community in a practical way. What a beautiful way to uh, worship. And so... You can check that out on your phones. Jonathan's going to tell us a little bit more about that after, the, uh, after worship time. We are to reflect uh, the, the life of Jesus to our community. This is why we're doing this Impact Alaska, to reflect how Jesus lived and how Jesus is. When we worship, truly worship Jesus, the, the character of Jesus will be evident in us. can't get away from not talking about this, I feel like. Um, physical expressiveness uh, in worship. Uh, there is a appropriateness, an appropriateness to physical expression in worshiping God. Worshiping God is never just meant to be purely an intellectual, uh, philosophical thinking about God's truth. It's not limited to that. And it's not limited to just, just inner emotional response either. But, but God gave us emotions as a gift and we're to use those to reflect uh, God and respond to him. God created our bodies to worship him. Uh, I get to finally say a Greek word. I'm, I'm Greek, by the way, and I've always wanted to say a Greek word. Uh, up here to show off my pronunciation skills, but there's a word, proskineo, is the Greek word, um, uh, and is to, uh, I get, I get to be careful here, prostrate. Yes. Huh? Okay. <laughs> it is to bend over at the uh, waist and bow down as an expression, and here's that word again, guys, an expression of homage. A, a public expression, basically, as you use your body to glorify him. Uh, physical expression is modeled all throughout the, the Bible in so many ways, but it is a way, it's a way of giving glory to God. So we are free to do that. That includes all kinds of stuff. Clapping, singing, raising your hands, Shouting, lots of shouters at Church on the Rock, man. Yeah! See? Right on cue. <laughs> Love it. Bowing. We can dance before the Lord. Um, or just simply stand in awe and stand still before the Lord. All of these are appropriate physical expressions. But I want to say, like, physical expression shouldn't be uh, a judge regarding how someone's walk with the Lord is, of how deep it is or not. It should be, it should flow from a heart that desires to bring glory to God. But we shouldn't judge either way. If someone is super, super expressive and bowing and crying and doing all this stuff, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have uh, a deep walk with the Lord or not, or they might have a deep walk with the Lord. But we shouldn't judge Either way, it's like David dancing in the streets. He just wanted to, to glorify God with his body. And that's okay. We are free to do that. But 
But when we respond in this way, we're also called again to reflect the life of Jesus. We don't want to uh, move out of your neighborhood in, in, in 10 years um, and someone say, that guy was a Christian? Really? And we want to reflect Jesus to our neighbors and those that are around us at all times. And again, when we worship Jesus, the character of Jesus will be evident in you. So going back to the evil doctor idol, um, after God delivers uh, the Israelites from Egypt, um, Exodus 32, 7, 8 uh, describes this, uh, this scene. Then the Lord said to Moses, go down because your people whom you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They've bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. And I've always looked at the scripture. I was like, man, this just looks really, really silly. And it's just, you know, they're bowing down before this, this, this cow. And commentaries have said that this, 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 this calf is a symbol of fertility and sex. And it was a cultural thing in Egypt that they had brought out of Egypt and they started worshiping it. But they were financing this thing. They were, they were, they were sacrificing to it. They, they had melted all of their jewelry. and It was all their money that they had put into it. And they were basically saying, look how much this thing is worth. They had cast it with their own skill. Look how cool this thing looks. I guess it looked pretty cool back then. I don't know, but look what we made. Look what we have done. We did this. Look what the human collective can do without God. When we get together, we put our brains together, look what we can do without God, and then we're going to give this thing credit now for delivering us when really God delivered them. I mean, even if we don't make idols, we're often uh, can be guilty of, of, of making God into our own image, molding him to fit our expectations, molding him to fit our desires, molding him to fit even our current circumstances. And when we do this, we end up worshiping ourselves rather than God. Look at this, look what we have done independent from God. We, we want to be God so we, we, we can worship ourselves. At least the Israelites were this way. It's, it's self-worship. And, and today, as in the Israelites' time, um, this can lead to all kinds of immorality, self-worship, self-satisfaction. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to please myself and what I have in my circumstance right now. There is a celebrity divorce court case going on with a super high-profile celebrity people and uh, you know, pray for them, pray for anyone going through divorce. They would find Jesus. Um, but the details of this case are uh, a result in self-worship. It is a super dark case, very uh, dark and depressing uh, what the results of self-worship can lead to. We become what we worship. We can have all kinds of self-pleasing uh, preferences, and we're not to put those above worshiping the one true God, even in Worship services, we can have all kinds of um, preferences. Uh, services are too planned, Jonathan. They're just too planned. The services are too spontaneous. The church is too big, man. The church is too small. Let's get it bigger. Too many old songs. Too many new songs. Uh, music and uh, tradition and creativity experience and liturgy, these all can be good things and, and, and auxiliary support systems for, for worship and they can all be a, a blessing. They can all, and they, 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 we have to be careful because they can also be a, a celebration of our own self-centeredness as well. And which brings me to identity can be the biggest idol and core point of Christian worship. We are to be centered in our identity of Jesus as we enter into worship. 
um, not just on Sunday, but in our lives. Uh, these things that we are to use to worship ought not to trump our worship to God, our position at work, our skills, our experience, uh, our, 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 even our failures can be, become our identity. Our family origin story can be the root of it. We can just wallow in our own self-centeredness when, 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 when things are down. Or to be rooted and reflect Jesus by identifying with, with Jesus. Um, my son, uh, Mason, turned seven uh, in February. And uh, his birthday happened to be on a Sunday. And I had services. And uh, after services, we had a scent class. So the birthday party was going to be later in the day, so I sent uh, my youngest, Felix and Cora, home uh, to get the, the house ready, get some balloons going and all that jazz. And during a sit class, he was back there with my friend Matt in the, in the sound booth, and I, I went back to check on him. I just thought maybe he'd be, you know, really bored. And I mean, a sit class is super exciting, but for a seven-year-old, it, you know. So I said, Mason, how you doing, man? I mean, uh, you hanging in there, man? It's been kind of a different day for you. Like, no, I'm great, Dad. I'm good. Yeah, I know, son, but, you know, I'm just kind of worried about you because you hadn't had your birthday present yet. Just want to kind of see if you're okay. No, nah, I'm, I'm good, Dad. Uh, but you haven't had your birthday cake yet. Dad, I'm good. We haven't sung you happy birthday yet. And he looks at me and says, Dad, I'm seven. Do you know what this means? <laughs> I'm seven, Dad. All that stuff is fine and dandy, but I'm centered in the fact that I'm, I'm mature now. <laughs> I don't need that stuff. I'm seven. I mean, this is a game changer. I'm in first grade. All, you know, my whole life is about to change. His mind wasn't wrapped up in all the auxiliary stuff that's cool, the birthday cake and all that jazz. We are to be centered in our identity and our maturity that we are no longer six anymore, but we're seven. <laughs> Read you Romans 12.1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. You know, Sunday services are, aren't always perfect, um, and either is our lives. I know as a musician for, for, for many, many years, um, I served myself as a Musician. I made albums for myself. I promoted myself. There wasn't much Jesus in my music for many years. And the results of that were quite dark. And as I rededicated my life to Jesus, and I put Jesus into my music, my life changed. Worship is the cure for my self-centered life. And I'll tell you, it's an awesome thing to know that in our life of worship, our imperfect life of worship, that Jesus makes it pure and he makes it holy. And that is true worship. It's a privilege to get to worship with you guys every Sunday. I get edified, I get encouraged by seeing you guys worship God. And there's a whole lot more to come. Thank you for listening. For more of our podcasts and to discover how you can connect, visit us at churchak.org or download our Church on the Rock AK app from either iTunes or Google Play.